Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher, and this week my guest is author Downwith Monaghan, and she has written an incredibly charming book called New Girl in Little Cove. Now, one of my favorite things to ask authors is little bits of inspiration and writing tips. So this week I'm going to ask Downwith. So many writers were familiar with rejection. And down at, in your acknowledgments, you refer to countless rejects, rejections and near misses uh, that led to you to shelf your book. But you took your manuscript off that shelf. And can you tell fellow writers out there what happened when you did? Okay. So, yeah, I, I wrote a, a different and a very different early version of New Girl in Little Cove, it wasn't called that then. And um, about 2017, I sent it out to probably 80 or 90 agents. Mm. Got some requests for full. Ultimately, it didn't go anywhere. Um, and so then, and you know, I got feedback suggesting things that um, I could maybe do or prob problems with the manuscript, but I didn't really, <laughs> I was too, um, I don't know if it was, I was too naive or what, but I just thought, well, what do they know? And plowed on with my um, self-destruction mission. <laughs> and I then sent it to a bunch of publishing houses that did not require agented submissions. And I got some interest. I got this. I, I, got, I think the thing is when you're getting the same feedback, you should probably listen. Yeah. But with one company, I actually made it as far as acquisitions. So the editor got in touch and said, I, I read your novel. I loved it. I'm taking it to acquisitions next week. And I thought, well, this is it. <laughs> Unfortunately, the people in the acquisitions department did not share the love. So at that point, I just thought, OK, you know what? I'm done. And I just, as you say, shelved it. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the thing I would say to people who want to write is, Rejection is is very much part of the writing process, but it because it's so common, you kind of have to accept it. So when I shelved that old manuscript, I didn't stop writing. I started writing a lot of flash fiction, and I had a lot of publications, and I met a wonderful community of flash fiction writers. So I kind of found my tribe, if you like. Yeah. Then um, I wrote another novel. So I wrote. 40,000 word, word draft of a second novel, which is, mm. yes. um, I wrote a novella in Flash that was published. So I kept on writing. Good so I, my advice would be, first of all, keep writing no matter what. It's the writing that, yes, we all want to be published, but it's the writing that is um, why we come to the, to the page. Yeah. Equally, I would say, if there is a project like my New Girl in Little Cove that you really, really, really believe in, go back to it. You know, I went back to this because those characters were still talking to me. They really wanted to be heard. And I also really, really believed that there was a market for this story. I loved the idea of, you know, a fish out of water arriving in Newfoundland, yeah. being confused and not understanding the place at all, and then gradually falling in love with it. Mm -hmm. And I honestly believe, Crystal, that in the, the writing, publishing industry, tenacity is just as important as talent. Just, yeah. just doing no matter what. And when my books, when this book actually arrived, when I got a box full of books from Collins Canada, I was so, you know, people do these unboxing videos, but I mean, I had no time for that. I just ripped it <laughs> <laughs> so afterwards I wanted to you know I wanted to say something about but it, you know I wasn't going to like reskill the box or anything so I just <laughs> a little video about you know my books came and how um the journey took me so long and I actually put on I'm going to show it to everybody this little badge I have oh yeah this yeah, so I put the badge on and I just did this little video on Twitter saying, my books came, I'm so happy. Yeah. Never up. It took me a long time, persist. And that would really be my message to your to aspiring writers out there. You write because you love writing. You don't write because you want a book deal. Mm -hmm. But if you work hard enough at it and believe in yourself and believe in a particular project, hopefully you'll get there. Just do not give up. 
Oh, I love that. So everybody do not give up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just, I love it. I love, I love it. I love it. And since you're, um, have you gone into the bookstores to see your book on the shelves? Well, unfortunately, of course, my book came out in Canada in March and okay. I'm in the UK and it's locked down. And we were in lockdown here still when it came out. Um, but I have seen it in bookstores and that is, you know, I went into a bookstore the other day to pick up a, a book that I had pre-ordered. And as I always do when I go into a bookstore, you know, they have the big tables so that I'll just have a little look. And there was my book. It was, like, you know, it was this little shock, a pleasant surprise to see it there. Oh, so yeah, I have seen it in bookstores. That's and wonderful. So many, yeah. And so many people in Canada have sent me pictures of it in books, bookstores in Canada, which has been really nice to see. So, and it's in the States too, and I've seen pictures of it in um, American bookstores. So that's really nice. Oh, that's fun. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's you. It's huge. It's really big to have a book. Yeah, I was, uh, I was pretty thrilled when it happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for our viewers, uh, you, you have said that you'll read a little passage for us. Yes, I'd love to. And before you start, can you uh, just kind of share with us why you've chosen this particular passage? Oh, I'm going to read the opening passage where Rachel first arrives in Little Cove. I think it'll be quite nice for them to see Little Cove for the first time, just as Rachel does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'll read the opening passage. Okay. September. 1985. Little Cove, population 389. The battered sign came into view as my car crested a hill on the gravel road. Only 389 people? Damn. I pulled over and got out of the car, inhaling the moist air. Empty boats tilted against the wind in the bay below. A big church dominated the valley, beside which squatted a low red building, its windows dark like a row of rotten teeth. This was likely St. Jude's, where tomorrow I would begin my teaching career. You lost? I whirled around. A gaunt man, about 60, straddled a bike beside me. He wore denim overalls and his white hair was combed neatly back on his forehead. Her broke down, he continued. No, I said, I'm just, my voice trailed off. I could hardly confide my second thoughts to this stranger. Admiring the view? He looked past me at the flinty mist now spilling across the bay. A soft rain began to fall, causing my carefully straightened hair to twist and curl like a mass of dark slugs. Might want to save that for a fine day, he said. His accent was strong, but lilting. It's right mozzy today. Mossy? Mossy, he gestured at the air around him. Then he folded his arms across his chest and gave me a once over. Now, he said, what's a young one like you doing out this way? I'm not that young, I shot back. I'm the new French teacher out here. A smile softened his wrinkled face. Down from Canada, hey? <laughs> as far as I knew, Newfoundland was still part of Canada, but I nodded. Bons Flynn, he said, holding out a calloused hand. I'm the janitor over to St. Jude's. Rachel, I said, Rachel O'Brien. I know you're staying with Lucille, he said. I'll show you where she's at. With an agility that belied his age, he dismounted and gently lowered his bike to the ground. Then he pointed across the bay. Lucille's place is over there, hello? Above a wharf, I saw a path that cut through the rocky landscape towards a smattering of houses. I'd been intrigued at the prospect of a boarding house. It sounded Dickensian. Now I was uneasy. What if it was awful? What about your bike? I asked, as Fonce was now standing by the passenger side door of my car. 
Ah, she's grand here, he said. I'll come back for it, why and by. Aren't you going to lock it? I thought of all the orphaned bike wheels locked to racks in Toronto, their frames long since ripped away. Jake had been livid when his racing bike was stolen. Not that I was thinking of Jake. I absolutely was not. No need to lock anything round here, said Fonts. I fumbled with my car keys, embarrassed to have locked the car from habit. Anyway, he said, but that color would steal it. I had purchased the car over the phone, partly for its price, partly for its color. Green had been dad's favorite color. And when the salesman said mountain green, I had imagined a dark, verdant shade. Instead, with its scattered rust garnishes, the car looked like a bowl of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Still, it would fit right in. I eyeball the houses as we drove along. Garish orange, lime green, blinding yellow. Maybe there was a sale on paint. Where's the main part of Little Cove? I asked. You're looking at it. There was nothing but a gas station and a takeout called MJ's where a clump of teenagers was gathered outside, smoking. A tall, dark-haired boy pointed at my car and they all turned to stare. A girl in a lumber jacket raised her hand. I waved back before I realized she was giving me the finger. Thank you. <laughs> so, I can picture it so perfectly. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for reading. Thank you so much for being a guest today on All About Canadian Books. Really appreciate your time. Oh, that was my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Krista. So that was Downeth Monaghan, author of New Girl and Little Cove, an absolutely charming read and fabulous advice for aspiring writers. Thank you so much for watching.